Our second reading, our New Testament reading, is from the letter of James. It is the only letter we have written by the person who uses this name. Uh, we're not a lot is known about who it was, but in the sermon I'll share with you at least one pretty strong guess. We begin at verse 1, uh, verse 17, chapter 1. Every generous act of giving, with every perfect gift, is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Have you ever had to get a message to someone right away, urgently? I mean, I know I have, though my definition of urgent might sound something like, I forgot to put laundry detergent on the list. <laughs> I've recently been enjoying a TV show that has come to its conclusion and which the rest of the world has been watching for six years. But as is typical for me, I just started watching this. I'm not sure why I'm always so far behind the curve where television is concerned. I think. Maybe I'm just waiting to see if it's going to be a classic or just, you know, a puff of nothingness. Anyway, this show is the one about Russian spies living among us, undercover, pretending to be Americans. The show is fascinating for many reasons, including its portrayal of the late days of the Cold War, its exploration of the nature of marriage, its depiction of a family in crisis because secret keeping has eroded their trust in one another, and much more. But the thing I'm focused on today is how communication takes place on the show. It's so slow. <laughs> the setting is the early 1980s, and you know I was an adult in the early 1980s, so of course I remember that there were no cell phones. You couldn't just make a call from anywhere. You had to find a phone booth. There's no internet, though its predecessor makes an appearance, something used only by the US government and the military called the ARPANET. This communication hub for a whole team of spies is a guy in a suit in a basement with a rotary phone and a bunch of electronic stuff around him. In one episode, the guy is killed by a very angry Navy SEAL, which means all the communications are down. And I spent the whole episode fretting, why is it taking everyone so long to figure out that George is dead? <laughs> and that's because I kept forgetting that this is the early 1980s and there is no expectation of instant communication for everyone, not even if it's urgent, not even if you're spies. The absolute snail's pace of communication in this show is frustrating and nerve-wracking, especially because everything is so urgent. So here's an imaginary pilot for a prospective TV show I would definitely watch. The time is 2,000 years ago, give or take several decades. 
The place is the Middle East, perhaps parts of Eastern Europe. The main character, his name is James, and he may or may not be the younger brother of Jesus, but he is definitely carrying on Jesus' work. These are the years after Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple is no more. And all the Jews who were not killed by the Romans in the desolation of Jerusalem are now scattered all over the known world. In the modern day, we call that the Jewish diaspora. And it still exists uh, for the most part. Jews are all over the world, not simply in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land. So, of course, James communicates with these people who are followers of Jesus through letters. Another not at all speedy mode of communication, especially 2,000 years ago. And this one is addressed specifically to those scattered Jewish followers of Jesus. And he calls them the 12 tribes in the dispersion. This is an urgent letter. James knows that his people are struggling. They are haunted by their memories of trauma and loss. They are experiencing the hardships of separation and temptation. How to even begin to offer help through this slow means of communication? How to encourage them? James begins by trying to help them find their way back, to reorient them, to remind them who they are. It's like the spiritual equivalent of asking someone to take a deep breath. <sighs> he starts with gratitude. Everything that is good, he says, every perfect gift, every generous action, they all start with God. They all reveal God's goodness. So look around, James implies anything that is good, a beautiful sunrise, a delicious fig, a kind word, all of it comes from God. And just as God is unchanging, always the giver of these gifts, forever the source of all that is good, James urges his readers to be just as constant, just as steady, just as faithful. Then, after he sort of helped people to find their place again, then he launches into a series of instructions to his far-flung kin in Christ. And he breaks all his concerns down into pairs of opposite or contrasting actions. And these words of encouragement are just as fresh for us today as they were in the year 80. The first pair is quick and slow. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. In a culture in which we can all send and receive messages instantly and therefore allows us to imagine that everything we have to say to one another is urgent, the art of listening can suffer. A few years ago, a colleague introduced me to a practice called mutual invitation, which you can use in small groups of people who are trying to talk or learn or decide together. In this, one person speaks, and the rules are no interruptions, no crosstalk, no responses. The person simply speaks until they've had their say. And because everyone else you know, doesn't have to formulate their response, engage in an argument, they're really free to listen, to listen deeply, to open their hearts to the speaker. When the person is finished, they invite someone else in the circle to speak, mutual invitation. And that person gets to speak to this group that is fully open, completely listening. Be quick to listen, James encourages his readers, and slow to speak. For some of us, this comes absolutely naturally. For some of us, this is really hard. For all of us, this is an essential part of honoring the image of God in one another. The second pair is get rid of and welcome. 
If we're seeing and honoring the truth of God's presence in everything, including one another's words, we will almost always naturally be doing this next part, ridding ourselves of the bad stuff and welcoming the good stuff. And the good stuff specifically is God's word planted deep within us. There is listening and there is taking in. There is taking in and then there's that moment when what you have taken in actually becomes a part of you and you can no longer separate yourself from your beloved. Remember that beautiful passage from Jeremiah? This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is urgent, James says. Purge yourselves of that stuff that's poisoning you and let God's place, God's very self, God's own essence and truth within you. Open the door, lay the fire, set the table, welcome God in. The next pair is hearing and doing, and we already talked about that a little bit with our young at heart folks. Fun fact about the letter of James, among the great leaders of the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin, our Presbyterian great-great-great-granddaddy, loved this letter. But Martin Luther, the Augustinian monk whose protests eventually gave birth to Lutheranism, hated it. He hated the letter of James. He called it an epistle of straw. And the reason he did that is in this next part of our passage. First, a little background. Both Luther and Calvin agreed that we cannot earn our way into God's good graces by keeping a long, impressive ledger of all our kindness and helpfulness and forbearance. That is not what God is all about. That is not what Jesus is all about. God is kind and merciful. God is grace. Jesus is Grace and mercy and forgiveness and strength for the journey. And all of that is God's free gift to us. We can't earn it. God gives it to us, not because we're good, but because God is good. James says, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers as well. Luther thought that this fell into that category of trying to earn God's approval by doing. But I think he got it wrong. I think it's a little backwards. When we welcome the grace of God in our lives, really take it in, receive it with gratitude, of course we are going to want to share that with others, not to get brownie points, but because God's grace infusing all our will will incite us to good actions, encourage our giving, prompt our care for all God's people, not to get grace, but because giving it feels so wonderful. We can't wait to give it away, to be doers of God's beautiful word that's already deeply a part of us. And this brings us to the difference between good religion, bad religion. Again, it all comes back to Jesus, what he was all about. You know, Jesus was a reformer too, much like Calvin and Luther. He looked around him and he saw pretty much what we all see when we look around us, a mixture of good and bad, often in the same person. Uh, good intentions mixed with self-absorption. Times when it's clear that people want to please God, but they get things mixed up, uh, put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, so to speak. More concern about codes than kindness. More fretting over self-righteousness than over the person lying, beaten up by the side of the road. Here's how James sums it up. Religion that is pure and faultless before God is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. One writer explains where this comes from. The commands to care for the orphans and widows reach back into Israel's experience as slaves in Egypt. 
liberated by God. They were to treat the marginalized with compassion. This is foundational for Christian ethics. Bad religion is only worrying about ourselves. Wondering, am I right with God? Am I saved? Good religion wonders, who is it that our society leaves by the side of the road today? Whom, on whom are we tempted to turn our backs? What indeed would Jesus do right here, right now? Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change in fulfillment of God's own purpose. God gave birth to us by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of all God's creatures. There are a few yellow leaves this morning on the tree on the Liberty Avenue side of the church. Harvest time is coming, even as we each pick the last of our tomatoes and summer squash and basil. In ancient times, the people of God offered to God the first fruits of their harvest. That means the best, the most beautiful, the most perfect part of their crops. They offered those to God in thanksgiving. In the opening verses of our reading this morning, James reminds us that God gave birth to us by God's own word of truth. And so we're the first fruits of God's creatures. James gives us this image so that we can begin to comprehend the length and height, the breadth and depth of God's love for us. This is the heart of James's urgent message for that original dispersed band of Jesus' followers. It is still God's urgent message for us to know how very much we are loved, how very precious we are in God's sight. To know that is to be empowered to share that love, to give it away, to let it go, to let our own blessings bless the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.